my, my attempt here is to get us to get totally given over to God. I'm not saying you're not. I just want to make sure that we are and that we realize how important it is. Um, so I'm going to tell you two stories that happened to me in my lifetime that has stuck with me for quite some time that helped me to understand the importance of being totally turned over to God. And this is my prayer, not only for this service, but for every service. Every time we gather, every time we gather, I want this to be our prayer. It comes from Ezekiel, uh, the uh, 36, 46th chapter, excuse me, the ninth verse, 46, 9. Whoever enters by the north gate, remember they had the city of Jerusalem, getting and it was surrounded by a wall, and they had certain gates to enter the city. Whoever enters by the north gate to worship is to go out the south gate. And whoever enters by the south gate is to go out the north gate. No one, emphasis on no one, no one is to return to the gate by which they entered. In other words, we should leave here different than the way we came in. Amen? Every prayer meeting, every Sunday meeting, uh, the release of Danielle's album this Friday night, past Friday night, we should leave here different than the way we came in. So, first story. And these are all true. I wouldn't lie. We're in church. That was a joke, guys. Um, June 1967, I graduated high school. I was 17 years old. My birthday's in March, so I was a very young 17. And I went to 12 years of pro Catholic parochial school, which I'm very grateful for. Um, and I had eight years with the Sisters of Mercy, four years with the Christian Brothers. And they deposited basic truths in me, so I, I really appreciate all that, uh, that training. And um, by the end of the year when we graduated, one of our friends decided to host a party at her home. And she was going to cook and prepare, and we were just going to show up. So I get to the house, and like in Queens, the house was semi-attached, um, and you had a stoop in front of you, and you'd walk up the stoop, you go through the first door, and when you're in the hallway, in my mind, on the left, there was where you put the mail and, and bells, and the name was over the, the mail slot, and you rang the bell, and then that would give you access into the hallway, the next door, and then you would go to the apartment. Well, I rang the bell, went through the second door, and as I'm walking through the hallway, and her apartment was on the first floor in the back, um, I had this smell hit me, this aroma that was just amazing. It wasn't perfume, it wasn't cologne. I know it was food. And then when I opened up the door to the apartment, I mean, it was like heat came out. I mean, this was in June, so heat came out of the apartment from the cooking and everything, and the smell was more intense. I mean, I started to salivate just from being in the room, right? And so I made the room by going around saying hello to everybody. I knew everybody there. They either went to our school or we were friends. And uh, on the right of, uh, of, the, of the room, there was like a table, a card table, uh, with chips and potato salad, you know, all those extra, extras that you have, cups, plastic plates, plastic forks, knives. And, uh, and then to my left, there was a small, I can see it in my mind, a small white four burner stove with chicken in a pan on the top, all brown and onions crispy. Do we have a picture of that? Can we show that? There you go. Yeah. Was that good? Looked that good. Really did. And uh, that was on the stove. So I went over, helped myself with some potato salad and cold salad and got a paper plate and plastic forks and, and knives. And then I made my way over to the stove to pick up a, a drumstick. And so I put it in my plate, and then I go find a place to sit down. And, you know, you got to balance the plate on your, on your lap while you're eating, and you don't want to look like a, a slob dripping it all over. So you're trying to be cool about it. At 17, you're always trying to be cool. And I put the plastic fork and the plastic knife into the drumstick while I'm talking, but it wasn't moving. And, uh, you know, the fork is wiggling, the, the knife is wiggling, and I didn't think nothing of it. I am keep talking. So I pick up the drumstick with my finger. And I bite into it, and my lips can feel the heat from the chicken, and my tongue actually can taste the garlic and the onions. The problem is my teeth couldn't penetrate the meat, and it was cold. My teeth got cold. And so when I pulled back the meat from the bone, I realized this wasn't cooked. It looked like this. Not like that, like this. <laughs> you already ate lunch, right? So it doesn't... <laughs> Gross, right? Gross. That wrecked me. To this day, I can't eat chicken. I got PTSD from chicken. 
Yeah, I do. So if I go to your house and you say, what do you, what do you like best to tell you so I'm sorry, I go, oh, oh. <laughs> you can ask my wife. It still affects me. I immediately, this is over 50 years ago. I immediately go back to that chicken. And it left a terrible, all the Listerine in the world wasn't going to take the taste out of my mouth. It was a nasty taste. Stayed with me for years. And um, that's what I want to talk to us about because I don't want us to be half-baked. We can be saved. We can be Christians. We can come to church and be half-baked. And the text that I want to use is from Hosea, the seventh chapter, the eighth verse. It says this, Ephraim is a flat cake not turned over. New Century says, like a pancake cooked only on one side. And the message translation says it best. Ephraim is half-baked. Now, Ephraim at the time was another name for northern Jerusalem. Uh, they were at a time where there was national peace. None of their enemies were coming against them. They weren't fighting. Uh, they're an agricultural nation, so they had really a great season of rain and crops, and bumper crops. Their commerce was incredible. Everything was going really, really well. Plus, they had great worship. They had the temple. They had celebrated the holidays. Uh, they had the priests that would teach them uh, from the scrolls of, of Moses. Um, they had great singing. King David, who was a, a musician himself, put together choirs and singers and uh, elevated their worship to another level 24-7. And he, he actually introduced new instruments to be used. So, I mean, th their whole worship experience was huge. And they had godly expressions like we do. They said, God bless. They said, amen. They said, praise the Lord. They said those things. It was a really in an incredible atmosphere. Similar, if I may make this comparison, similar to our experience on Sundays. We have teaching. We have singing. We have a building. You know, we have all the things going for us. The problem, the concern is that we can get overly familiar with church and it becomes robotic. We know when to stand. We know when to raise our hands. We know when to say amen. And there's no depth. There's no passion. It's all north of the neck, as they say. And uh, that's a concern for us today as it was in the day of Hosea. In fact, the apostle Paul wrote to Timothy, who was pastoring in Ephesus, and he tells them that there's a form of godliness, but a denying of power. A form, you can have a form of godliness but you deny the power. You deny the move of the Holy Spirit. You deny that hunger, that desire that we're supposed to have. We can get very used to church. We can have churchianity and not Christianity. We can have churchianity, it becomes a culture, and not Christianity. And at that time, in Hosea's time, the people, they wanted happiness. They didn't want holiness. At that time, they wanted God to change their negative circumstances and protect them, but they didn't want to change their lifestyle or their churches. They wanted God to remove their sin, but they didn't want to repent from their sin. Basically, they just wanted a quick fix to their problems. They wanted God to be like this genie in a lamp that would just cure all the situations. So God uh, uses this metaphor through the prophet Hosea to help them understand that their spiritual condition is not good. So he gives them a word picture. In Hosea's day, which everybody knew about this at this time, if you wanted bread, there was no stop and shop to go to. Most likely, unless you were very rich, you made your bread. And how you would do that is by getting a little water and flour and making a patty out of it, or like a tortilla. You could add an egg, you could add spices if you want, but the basic ingredient was water and flour. And then you would make a fire and you would surround the inside of the fire with flat rocks. And then once the uh, rocks were nice and hot, you would take the patty and you would slap it on the side and wait a few moments. And then when it was brown, you would turn it over on the other side and you wait a few moments. And then you would take it away from the rock and now you got bread. It's pretty simple. But if you didn't turn it over, well, you ruined it. I mean, you, there was, the potential was there. Or the ingredients was there. You had the know-how. But you neglected to turn the cake over, so you ended up with a mess, really. Um, good intentions, but it failed. J just like my friend who made the chicken over 50 years ago. She had great intentions. The potential was there, but because she only cooked it halfway, it was ruined. Nobody really ate it. So is it possible, just consider this, is it possible, like the Israelites, that we have so much going for us? We got people to take care of our babies. We got people that greet us at the door. 
Um, we have people that sing to us and minister to us. We have those that protect our building and keep us safe. We have people that teach to us. And uh, with all the things, the great things that we have, is it possible that we, without even knowing, are only half-baked? We come to church. I, I applaud that you're here. Please, watching online, thank you. But is it possible that we're half-baked in our commitment, in our devotion to God? in our reading of scripture, in our waiting on the Lord, in our praying, not just here. I'm glad that you're here, trust me, but not just here. There are seven days of the week, and I don't want us to be full on just two days a week, prayer meeting and Sunday. I want us to be full on every day of the week so that when we do come here, that there's a real sense of God's power because we're all turned over for God, full on for God. Um, you, you could be half-baked in your marriage. That's a terrible place to be. You can be half-baked on your job or in your commitment to whatever you're doing. You could be half-baked to your family. And um, I want us to all, all of us, all of us, if you call this church your church, even if you don't call this your church, I want all of us to go to men and women of God with stature and favor. And um, if we're not turned over, well, that, that's not going to happen. God will not be able to use us. I want you to know God wants to use every single one in the sound of my voice whether you're in the room or watching online. And you might never ever take a mic. You may not ever stand here. But you are around people that me, myself, could never get to. Best evangelists in the world could never get to because you're with them at work, in the gym, at home. And God wants to use you. But if we're half-baked, if we act one way in church and another way on the job, well, we're going to ruin the, the, uh, the opportunity that God will give us that we can be used. And no, we're not perfect. None of us are perfect. The only one that's perfect is Jesus. You know that, right? But we can be totally turned over to God. And then when we're living a life turned over for God, both sides, all in, then we're eligible for the 7,000 promises that God has. You know, um, uh, Willie was just saying before about how when, when you bring in the whole tithe, he was teaching on tithing, on giving, on finances. Then, then when you do that, God responds to that in a very good way. Um, but if you don't, well, then you forfeit the blessing. I, I want us to have all the 7,000 promises of God in the Bible. I love the fact that the Bible says in Luke 19 that he came to save and seek that which was lost. Because in 1975, before we accepted Christ, Marie and I were very, very lost. We were divorcees, living together immorally, doing all kinds of drugs. Maria overdosed on heroin three times. You wouldn't believe it by looking at her now. But three times, we had to throw in a tub and pour cold water on her to get out of a convulsion that she went through. And we thought we were cool. We thought, yeah, we were, we were cool. Um, but when we went to church, someone invited us. Don't, don't ever stop inviting someone to church. Yeah, but I did the last time when they said no. We said no plenty of times. But one time we said yes. Oh, God only needs one time because he never fails. He will never fail. Yeah, one time we went to church and I didn't want to go. I had drugs in my pocket. I hated the whole experience until the pastor made an altar call. And both me and I went up and accepted Christ. That was September 1975, 49 years ago. And, um, okay, thank you. Wait, you're making me stop and I got a clock in front of me, so I got to keep going. And that night, nobody told us. It was, it was one of those encounters I mean, considering where we came from, uh, we went home, we separated the, the, the mattresses. I went back and lived with my, my parents. We threw out the drugs, the drug paraphernalia, the syringes, the cocaine spoons, the Playboy books, the clothes, everything down and incinerated. We had an, an Acts, we had an Acts 19 service and we didn't even know what Acts 19 was. We burned everything. But that's what God will do. And that's what God wants. He wants us totally. Well, God, you know what? I'm going to throw out the drugs, but I won't throw out the, the Playboy book. You know, you're going to need a little help every once in a while. You know, or uh, I'll throw out the liquor, but I don't want to throw out the clothes. You know how much money I spent on these clothes? No. Everything went down the incinerator. Everything. We were full on for God. That's what God wants from all of us. And not, not just when we're saved. I don't want to be full on for God going back to 1975. Today and tomorrow, I want to be full on for God. I want to serve God all my life. And I can come to church and, and, and be deceived because I'm hearing the words uh, of that are being spoken, but yet I, you know, I'm a little reluctant in maybe turning over everything to God. Listen to what the prophet said, Ezekiel, in 33. To God's people, remember, this is God's people he's speaking to. 
My people come to you as they usually do and sit before you to hear your words, but they do not put them into practice. Their mouths speak of love, but their hearts are greedy for in injustice gain. Indeed, to them, you are nothing more than one who sings love songs with a beautiful voice and play an instrument well, for they hear your words, but do not put them into practice. That's someone that goes to church. Are they a believer? Are they Christians? Yeah, they just have baked. And so how's God going to use them? How can he use them? You know, and, and listen, I, I, I believe that you're here, and well, I know that you're here, but I believe that because you're here, you want more of God. And that's great, but God wants more of us. The problem is not more of God, it's more of us that has to be laid down. And Jesus addressed this issue. He, he had followers that he had to talk to, and both in Luke and in Matthew, he addresses the same issue. He says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? And then he goes on to say, if you hear the words and you ignore them, you're going to have a collapse. There's going to be a great fall. Matthew's version is, everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man or a foolish woman or a half-baked man or a half-baked woman. We hear the words, we sit in church, we say amen, we nod our heads, but we don't apply it. Jesus' half-brother, James, writes in the first chapter, two Christians to the early church, he writes, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourself, do what it says. Th think about the magnitude of that. I can sit in church all my life and hear the word and be deceived. Because when I hear a word about whatever uh, character or, or conduct uh, it's, it's addressing, I hear it and I may agree with it, but I'm not willing to apply it. I don't want to remove anything that's keeping me from applying it. The Apostle Paul writes to the church at Corinth, 735, verse, chapter 7, verse 35 that you may live in a right way in undivided devotion to the Lord. That means we live here in the church, at home, on the job, in our car, uh, while we're texting, while we're watching Instagram, our entertainment, all of that. Is it, is it undivided to the Lord? Is, are we living in a right way to God when we're uh, involved in these activities or we're not? If we're not living righteously before God, and again, it doesn't mean perfect. It just means aligned with God. Well, then, then, then we're half-baked. We're half-baked. You know, Jesus said this in John 15 and 17. He said, we are in the world, but we're not of it. And, and God leaves us in the world so that we might be a light, that we might be sold. But you don't want the world, the world in you or in us. Just like a boat belongs in the water. That's where it belongs. Like we belong in the world but we're not of it. Water getting in a boat ruins the boat's purpose. You understand? And that's what God is saying to us. And as, as, as saints, you know, we want to make sure that we're doing everything right by God. That's why we take the time out to talk about offerings and stewardship and monies. Um, you know, if you're in debt, we want to help you with that. We're not asking for money from you. We just want to help you to get out of debt so that you can be the kind of believer, saint, Christian that you should be, so that you can bless others, so that you can go on mission trips, so that you can support things like the prison fellowship and so on and so forth. We talk about relationships. You know, we want to make sure that if you're dating, that, that you're dating someone that is equally aligned with you when it comes to the things of God. You heard about the term, you don't want to be unequally yoked. And as a pastor, listen, I, we deal with it all the time about people that, you know, he was my dream boat, but he ends up to being a nightmare, you know, because he said he wanted to come to church with you. But once you got married, he stopped coming to church or she stopped coming to church. So we talk about relationships. We talk about the uh, disciplines we took because we want to make sure that you're, we're all growing in God and we never stop growing in God. And so we, we want to be, and you have to realize, too. I may not agree with you, and you may not agree with me, but we can still love one another. Just because I don't agree or you don't agree doesn't mean we hate each other. You know, uh, there's that term here, we have, to, we have to agree that we can disagree, but we need to do it according to Christian val val uh, values. And um, I, I, want, I want to say this, I'm, we're coming so close to Election Day, and I want you all to vote, I, I, and I want, I can't make you vote, but I want to encourage you to vote. It's the people died so that we can vote. You realize that? Yeah. People gave their lives so that we can vote. And to trash shouldn't be like, be, be lazy and say, well, there's no parking and there's lines. And, you know, I don't know if I'm registered. You can find all that out online right now. On your phone, you can find out. You know, you don't have to leave the, the room. But you should vote. 
But I, I, may I, may I suggest a mentality? You are Christians. I'm a Christian before I'm a Democrat and before I'm a Republican. Few amens. Let that sink in. We are Christians. Our life is built on the Bible. Our values, our policies are built on the Bible. And so we have to make sure we always take a Christian perspective, a Christian's uh, worldview of what we're doing. And, and, and we have to make some decisions. Uh, and I pray for our government. Paul tells Timothy, he pr pray for those over you in leadership. And Nero was in charge. Nero was in the, the emperor of Rome. He was killing Christians, crucifying them, feeding them to lions. And Paul said, pray for them. I pray Democrats, Republicans, lefties, righties, Middle East, independents. I pray for them all because they're, they're our leaders and we need to pray for them. I pray for the NYPD, pray for the FDNY, pray for first responders. These people are putting their lives on the line. They may save you one time. So I, I want us to be a holistic church when it comes to the things of God. And so voting time is coming around, and you got to make the time to go vote, and they make it pretty easy with all the hours. Um, but I just, my suggestion to you, I can't tell you what to do, but my suggestion is look at the parties, because it's the parties that run. You're not voting for a black woman or a white man. That's being naive. You're voting for parties. It's parties that rule really, not the person in the White House. They, they govern, but they're influenced and they're managed by, by the uh, policies and by the, uh, the party that uh, they are part of. So you have to look at the party's values. Do they align with Christian values? Remember, this church was founded on Judeo-Christian uh, values. People laugh at that now, but that's how it started 300 years ago. And so, you know, uh, we want to make sure that we continue that because, again, we're Christians before we're anything. People say, oh, you're Italian. No, I'm a Christian. Yeah. Yeah. Italian has nothing to do with it. Yeah. I'm a Christian first. And, and we have to take my suggestions. That's the position. So when you, when you go to vote and you look at your parties and you analyze them, well, what parties are in line with Scripture and what parties are not? Do, do they agree with the Bible being the Word of God? I, I don't feel I'm a prophet. But I really feel there's, there's going to come a day when they inaugurate someone in office, the president, the mayor, the governor, they, they put their hand on the Bible and they swear their allegiance to be genuine and authentic to their office. There's going to come a day they're going to take that away. Because people, the Bible, the word of God, oh, there's plenty of books. with them. No, there's only one book. It's from Genesis to Revelation. It's the Bible. Now, that may... Well, but I know you know we live in a world that would not applaud that. They would think we were foolish. We were naive. We were like an you know, ostrich with our head in the sand. So we have to go by what the Bible says. So does, does the party that I'm going to vote for, do they align themselves with one man and one woman in marriage or not? Do they align themselves that God made male and female? Or they align themselves with a whole bunch of other genders that are not according to Scripture? You know, do they align themselves with parent, parent, parenthood? Or they realize, like these children, you know what? Uh, this is why I knew I had to speak this day. All those babies, we had two services, all those children there. We need to protect them. And I'm sure mom and dad will protect them. But there's a time where they go to school. And what's going to happen at school? I have five granddaughters. I have daughter-in-laws, and I have an incredible wife, and I have all of you sisters here that I love. I don't want no man walking into your bathroom while you're in the bathroom or your locker room. That shouldn't be. I don't. My, my granddaughters play lacrosse. They play soccer. They're all in college now. I don't want them playing against a man. That, that's, that's crazy. God made them male and female. And you can't just decide you want to be a female or a male one day. It's, it's, it, in fact, I really, I'm not a smart guy. I'm really not. But I think some of the stuff they're saying is, what? What? You really believe that? You can just flip the script on this? You know, the books that they're allowing to you teachers, I love you teachers. I thank you for them. But some of the, the books that they're allowing and saying it's, it's, it's permissible in libraries, really? That all boys are not born blue, you know, to push a, a, a homosexual agenda. We love everybody. We just may not agree with the, with the choices that they make. So we have to decide what what is the policies that the party that I'm going to vote for are in. Are they okay with transgenders? 
Are they okay with, with taking children and changing their sex because the child thinks he wants it? 10 years old. My wife is in LA. She's a, speaking at a pastor's conference. And um, they wanted a woman's perspective in, in pastoring and pastoring a church. So she went. You know, my song is whenever she's away, ain't no sunshine when she's gone. That's true. And she's gone much too long. And I know, and I know, and I know, and I know. <laughs> People ask me all the time, what are you eating when she's away? Cereal. What are you kidding? <laughs> one bowl, one spoon, come on. <laughs> Gallon of milk, I'm good, you know? But she's in L.A. and California, and they're, they're dealing with the fact that the, the state can take your children away from you if you don't agree with them if they want a transgender. So you have no, no rights. That's what they're facing. So what, 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 what party deals with that? That's what you have to vote for. And I pray for wisdom for all of us. I'm not telling you what to do. I'm just bringing my concern as to because they're going to rule the country and the country is going to go a certain direction. And the way it's been going lately has been crazy. But um, I, for one, pray, I, pray, I pray for President Biden. My heart goes out for him. It does. I feel bad for where he's at. And, and, and I, I don't appreciate the jokes that they make against him. I really don't. I really don't. I don't appreciate any of the sarcasm and jokes they made against, make against any of our leaders. Because you know what? I've traveled a bit. This is still by far the best country in the world with all its faults. With all its faults. Daniel 725. 725. And they shall speak great words. Now, Daniel was kidnapped and brought to Babylon, which is a very ungodly country. And he worked for the government. And they still, and they shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints. Well, that's what caught my eye. And wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change the times and the laws. That's why we have to pray. We need to pray. And while I'll just pray, and whoever gets in office uh, will get in the office. Well, I think that's a very liberal way of thinking. Someone once says that without him, we cannot. But without you, he will not. Without him, we cannot, but without you, he will not. So yes, we need to pray, but we need to also do what we're supposed to do. Second story, true. Um, I was invited to a pastor's luncheon, and uh, I'm not stopping when it says 1.30, so I'm just letting you know. <laughs> because it's all you're clapping. You're the ones who are clapping. I'm not clapping. I was invited to a pastor's luncheon, and it was glorious. You know, and when you leave those meetings, it's like, man, you're just feeling great. You feel like you can give me the Goliath. I'll take them out right now, you know. Uh, and so I left. It was about 2 o'clock. It was a luncheon. And it was raining outside and drizzling. And uh, again, I was really feeling good. And I walked up the block to go find my car where I parked it. And when I got to the place where I thought I parked it, it wasn't there. All right, so I'm thinking maybe it's part of the afterglow from the meeting I forgot. So I walked further up, all the way up to the next block, and I didn't see it. So I now turn around and come down the block thinking, okay, maybe I passed it. Maybe I was so preoccupied I missed the car. And I get to the place where I surely knew I parked it, and it's not there. And then God gives me a revelation. Durso, your car has been stolen. <laughs> and I know that doesn't ever happen in New York, but it did happen that day. And so I'm standing on the corner uh, in the rain, not looking very happy. I lost the afterglow from the pastor's conference. I was right out the window. And a car pulled up, and it was another pastor in the car, and he rolls down the window and says, uh, Pastor Durso, are you okay? I said, yeah, I'm okay. And he goes, you don't look okay. I said, yeah, well, uh, I think my car was stolen. He goes, well, come on, I'll drive you to church. I said, well, I really probably should go report it. He says, okay, well, there's a precinct right down the block. Let's go. I'll take you. So, all right, so I get in the car. I appreciate it. So it brings me to the precinct. He waits in the car. I get out. I go inside. Police officer sitting at the desk says, uh, can I help you? I said, yeah, I think my car is stolen. So he kind of gave me that look like, you think? You know, <laughs> well, you, you know, you know, I mean, it's only 3 in the afternoon, but well, you, you know, uh, I said, well, yeah, well, I, 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 I can't find it. He goes, all right, well, tell me where it was. So I says, well, if you go out, out of the precinct, you go to the corner, across the street, and go up half the block. He said, across the street? 
I said, yes. He goes, well, that's not my jurisdiction. Uh, what, do you, what do you mean? Well, you know, it's, we're broken up in different jurisdictions, and that one, the street is the dividing line, and that belongs to this precinct where he tells me where it is, and it's some other place pretty far. But now, this is like three-ish. So the bus is out, the school buses are out, people changing, just it, a lot of traffic. It's raining. My car is gone. I wasn't a happy camper. And uh, I said, okay, so I get out, and there's my friend waiting in the car, and he goes, well, what happened? So I tell him. So he said, all right, come on, I'll take you. Now, that made it even worse, because I wanted to smack him, because he was being too much like Jesus. I wasn't, I wasn't like Jesus at all. I was just frustrated. But he's, he's you know, I'll take you, come on. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> so we drive to the, where the precinct is, and the precinct was actually an old house, an old Victorian house that they turned into a precinct in the heart of Brooklyn. And uh, at this time now, there were police cars on the sidewalk and, and vans all over the place, because there's no parking in Brooklyn. And police officers were coming in and out. And so there's a lot of commercial in, in the precinct. So I go in, there's an officer behind the desk, and he says, may I help you? And I says, yes, I, I need to report a, um, my car stolen. And it's getting very loud because, as I said, there's this shift change. And so officers are talking to other officers, and they're, you know, high-fiving each other, and they're seeing each other. And, and it was all good and healthy, but it was really loud, a lot of noise. And so I said, oh, I got to report my, my, my car stolen. So he's, all right, well, listen, go to the office that's sitting over there at the desk, and she'll give you the reform, at the form. And this officer that was sitting here, uh, it wasn't a desk, it was a table, like a, a card table. And she had papers on it and clipboards. And unfortunately, as I'm turning to go there, uh, one officer uh, puts his walkie-talkie, and he had some other stuff in the back, on the desk. And there was really no room for it, but he put it on the desk. And all of a sudden, the officer that was sitting there lets out this yellow, this, this scream, I mean, this yell. Uh, Does this look like your locker? Does this look like a dumping ground? But she used some adjectives <laughs> that I, I don't want to repeat. It was more like, does this look like your bleaking, bleaking locker? Or does this look like your bleaking, bleaking dumping grounds? And it was getting tense. And everybody's got guns. You know, I got a wetsuit on. I'm a little nervous. <laughs> you know, this was a really intimidating atmosphere. I, by this time, I didn't even want my car. You know, it's, <laughs> I really didn't. I didn't want to go through all this that I had to go through to get the car. So anyway, uh, I go over and I stand in front of her desk and she's writing. And um, I'm waiting. And you know, when you wait like a minute or two, it seems like an hour, you know. Uh, so I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting. Nothing's being done. She's still writing. And so I want to try to get her attention. So I think, well, if I just, you know, bounce on the balls of my feet, you know, she'll see me going up and down and she'll say, oh, she'll, oh yes, you're there. Yeah, can I help you? No, that didn't happen. So I stopped bouncing on the balls of my feet, and I think, all right, I just, I'll rock. If she didn't see this, she'll see this, definitely. See. Nope, nothing worked. So I come up with this great idea that I'll clear my throat, right? <clears throat> As I go for the second clearing, she goes, I see you. Oh, 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 oh. Back up, back up, back up. I'm sorry, but they told me to come to you and report my car stolen. I know, I know. Just wait a minute. Okay. So I'm not saying nothing. I'm not moving. I'm not saying nothing. So eventually she gives me a clipboard. She goes, here, go fill this out and don't ask me for a pen. Absolutely, I will not ask you for anything. <laughs> so there was one small wooden bench against the wall, against the radiator, uh, for me to sit down and fill this out. But also, the bench I could hold two people. There was a female sitting on the bench, handcuffed to the railing there. And she's crying, and she looked like she's been out all night. And uh, she looks at me, and she goes, can you help me, please, can you help me? There was drugs in the house. I didn't know there was drugs in the house. It was my brother's drugs. He didn't tell me, and the cops came in, and now I'm arrested, and I can't go to jail. And she's going on and on. And I don't know what to tell her. Uh, I, I felt like the worst pastor ever. I just didn't, you know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm just here to report my car stolen. And, and I really don't even want it anymore. And, I, and she's just going on and on. And while she's going on, I'm trying to be as sympathetic as I can to her, but I can't help her. All of a sudden, I hear, Pastor Derso! Like, real loud like that. Uh, over all the other noise in the precinct. Pastor Derso, how are you? 
And I look up, and there's this handsome police officer coming, walking me with his arms out like this. I got up, and I hugged him. I didn't know who he was. I didn't. I didn't. But he was showing me love. I needed TLC at the time. So, I was, so, so we're hugging each other, and I'm patting his back. And Pastor Durso, so good to see you. And um, I said, oh, that, that, that's good, brother. I mean, I'm sorry, but I, where do I know you from? He says, well, you spoke at our men's meeting a few weeks ago. What a great meeting. I said, well, I, I appreciate that, brother. Thank you very much. He said, well, why are you here? He was very loud. He was very happy to see me. I was happy to see him, too. <laughs> why are you here? I said, well, I have to report my car stolen, and so I'm waiting to get it, 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 it processed. Well, who's taking care of you? So I says, So he said, oh, don't worry about it. She'll take good care of you. She sings in the choir at our church. Yeah. True story. Does she sing at the choir at our church? Absolutely. Is she saved? Oh, I'm sure. She's just half-baked. See, and that's what happens when we're half-baked. We might live one way in church, but then when we get into other environments, we shift. We shift. I often wonder about all the singers and musicians, gifted people that have left the church because they had an encounter with someone in the church who was half-baked and it left a bad taste in their mouth. Now, when you got a bad taste in your mouth, it takes a lot to get rid of it. Um, God has plans for all of us, every single one of us, watching online, up in the balcony, for our deaf ministry over there at the top. He has plans for you to be prospered, Jeremiah 29, 11, not to harm you, to give you a future. But we have to align ourselves with God. We have to make sure that we're under his covering. I mean, I, I think again about all those children that we dedicated today. I want to live right in front of my children and my grandchildren. In fact, in front of all children. I don't, when I drive my car, when, I, when I'm listening to things, I want to be right before God. I mean, I, I thought about this. Maybe this is a stretch, and you'll just put up with me a little bit. But suppose Noah only built a half ark. What, 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 what would have happened? Suppose Joshua only walked around the walls of Jericho half the amount of times. Suppose David only swung that slingshot halfway. Suppose Jesus only went halfway to the cross. Half is not enough. Almost is not enough. You can't almost be saved from a fire. You can't almost be saved from a sinking ship. It's got to be all or nothing. And I want to make sure all of us, guys, we're full on for God. We're totally turned over. Singers, musicians, pastors, deacons, because it could happen to anybody. We can get so accustomed to what happens in church that we almost get robotic about it. Put it on autopilot. I want us all to hear, well done, well done, not half-baked, well done, good and faithful, it's two, good and faithful servant. Yeah. Well, one less imagery. You know, when Jesus fed the 5,000, 4,000, he used the bread that they gave him, which is good for when it comes to your offerings. Always thank God for what you receive. Well, it's not enough. Thank God for what you receive. He'll do the multiplication. He'll do the miracle. But when they gave the bread to feed the 5,000, 4,000, Jesus blessed it, broke it, and gave it out. Suppose that bread was only half-baked. He couldn't have used it. It would have been a mess. Like with our lives, guys. Full on for God. David's prayer. Psalm 86, 11. King David, give me an undivided heart. For my heart to be undivided, I got to be turned over on both sides. 